Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, the three-peak challenge for long red ultra-deep stool metagenomics on the Promethean. I am Michelle Ashton of Labberts, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by Labberts and brought to you by Zymo Research. Zymo Research is a privately owned company that has been proudly serving the scientific community with state-of-the-art molecular biology tools since 1994. The beauty of science is to make things simple is a mantra that is reflected in every Zymo Research product from epigenetics to DNA RNA purification technologies. Historically recognized as the leaders in epigenetics, today Zymo Research is breaking boundaries with innovative solutions for microbiome measurements. Zymo Research is the first company to develop microbiomics solutions from collection to conclusion based on new rigorous standards for microbiome measurements. Zymo Research has been leading the initiative to improve reproductibility and accuracy in the field by developing the first commercially available microbiome standards. To learn more about our sponsor, please visit www.zymoresearch.com. Let's get started. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing Education's Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. I now present today's speakers, Dr. Joshua Quick, Research Fellow at the University of Birmingham in the UK, and Dr. Yanina Crumbeck, the Director of Microbiome Applications at Zyma Research Corporation. For the complete biography on our speakers, please visit the Biography tab at the top of your screen. Our speakers will now begin their presentations. Hello, uh, my name is Dr. Joshua Quick and uh, I work at the University of Birmingham in the United Kingdom. And today I'm going to present to you uh, a title named, a talk titled The Three Peaks Challenge uh, for Long Read Ultra Deep Stool Metagenomics on the Promethean. So, Nanopore uh, sequencing is a relatively new technology. It was uh, brought to market only in 2015. And uh, it's, a, it's notably a long read sequencing technology. It's the second of two long read sequencing technologies after pac bio sequencing. And what that means is that you're able to sequence very long molecules, which are important for, um, for things like de novo assembly. Up until now, the yields from these instruments has been quite limited, but with the introduction of the Promethean um, in the last couple of years, the opportunity has arisen to generate very large long read data sets. And that's exciting because it allows you to increase the understanding of complex microbial communities. Um, and this is generally known, uh, generally a uh, an area known as metagenomics. So we particularly have two clinical translational projects here in Birmingham that we're interested in applying this technology to. The first is fecal microbiome transplants, which are being used more and more for the treatment of chronic C. diff infection. Um, our particular uh, study is looking at the effectiveness of fecal transplants in a different condition called ulcerative colitis. Um, and in that particular project, we're, we're looking at the um, at the microbial community of the, of the human gut before and after transplantation. And we have a second project uh, where we're looking at the respiratory microbiome of cystic fibrosis patients. And uh, this is a chronic lung condition and, the, the, and it evolves over time. And we're interested in looking at the evolution of the respiratory microbiome in the disease. So the, the particular detail of the things that we're trying to do is that we're trying to enable 
a single config de novo assembly, and that basically means taking a very complicated uh, mixture, such as the uh, human gut, and using long reads, being able to de novo assemble, um, you know, short, uh, you know, entire bacterial genomes from that complex mixture. And this is this is where it, where it comes back to the fact that this has only really been possible with the uh, in, with the uh, with the introduction of the Prometheus and being able to generate very large data sets of long reads because the human gut contains uh, many hundreds of back individual bacterial species that are quite wide range of abundance and in order to be able to assemble whole genomes from those you need to to uh, to produce uh, sufficient um, coverage from from those organisms to be able to assemble them so um, we're trying to be able to link genes to chromosomes we're trying to be able to identify strain level variation using haplotyping in, in, in the case of, of things like um, the evolution of, of the cystic of the of, of microbes in chronic uh, or chronic uh, colonization in diseases like cystic fibrosis. Um, but very specifically, what we want to do is to be able to track uh, strains um, from uh, before and after transplantation of, of fecal transplants. So. We want to be able to uh, see if, if individual strains persist uh, after a patient has received a transplantation, and that is, and for that application, de novo assembly is uh, very important to be able to assemble those genes and look at that variation. So we've been working on ultra long read sequencing methods for a very long time in Birmingham, pretty much since the um, pretty much since the introduction of nanopore sequencing, and ultra long read sequences are defined as reads over over 100,000 base pairs um, is, is our definition. So long read sequencing typically is classed as anything you know, above 10,000 bases and then ultra long would be 100,000 bases. Um, the requirement in order to, to achieve ultra long read sequencing methods, you need very high molecular weight input DNA. And the way that we originally did this um, we actually did the human genome with ultra long reads uh, um, two, two, two years, two or three years ago. Uh, and the way that we did that was using a uh, phenol chloroform extraction method, which is very traditional, um, originally uh, invented, I think, in first published in something like the 1950, 1956. So very old method. Um, and this particular protocol, which I used, came from a very famous book called Molecular Cloning by Sambrook which many people will have seen if they've ever been in a lab, but basically it relies on the uh, detergent-based uh, detergent, um, lysis of, of cells, digestion of proteins by proteinase K, and then, and then um, removal of proteins using um, phenol emulsions before uh, ethanol precipitation. And uh, the way that we were able to generate reads um, over 100,000 base pairs, up to a million base pairs, was using a kit uh, that Oxford Nanopore developed called the Rapid Kit, and that is the the kit relies on a method um, called tagmentation, um, which is which is uh, done by using something called a transpose uh, transposase complex, and that is a protein which which complexes with an with an oligo in 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 in, uh, in a wild type. This would be a transposon, which is uh, and it and it and it and it, 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 it is used. It, um, it facilitates the movement of genes, transposons around the genome. In this particular case, you use transposon ends, um, and you you can you can sort of cut and paste um, the adapters into a, into a genome, and it's very useful for producing next generation sequencing libraries. And the way that we managed to generate ultra long reads was purely by taking the standard um, kit and then putting a very large amount of high molecular weight DNA in there. To, to minimize the number of insertions per molecule, so basically saturating uh, the, the, the number of transposose complexes. Now, our first uh, attempt doing this produced uh, a data set on E. coli, um, which had an N50, and an N50 is a, is a measure that we, of, of a measure of, of length of a, of a read set um, of 65 thousand base pairs with a maximum of 778,000 base pairs. So this is clearly something which is uh, possible um, with the, with, you know, cutting edge technology such as nanopore sequencing, being able to thread a molecule, nearly a million base pairs through, through a pore is, is seriously impressive stuff. So from the 
pulse field gel you can see on the right hand side of this slide we're, we're able to, to extract uh, DNA of two to three hundred thousand base pairs using this phenol chloroform method from E. coli and that means that even using even the fact even if we have to uh, to 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 cut or insert um, and the the, uh, the using the using the transposase we can still get reads over uh, you know over a hundred thousand base pairs you know very easily so it's very suitable for uh, for, for, for what we were trying to do uh, back then, it, the, the, the the DNA input allowed that insertion and still to still generate to still generate long reads. The reason why we chose this kit was actually because the it minimises the amount of handling of the DNA, which we found to be the most important factor in um, in generating ultra long reads. And this slide here is actually the um, is actually uh, the E. coli genome represented um, across the across the figure, and showing eight nanopore reads, which span the entire genome with overlaps, with an average length of 750,000 base pairs per read. So a tiling path across the entire um, 4.5 million base pair E. coli genome from eight reads, and we are able to assemble these reads um, on a single core in one and a half seconds and this is really to demonstrate the power of ultra long reads to be able to assemble genomes rapidly and also to show that if you can get rid long reads then de novo assembly is a completely trivial um, uh, process whereby all you're trying to do is, is identify um, eight overlaps this is a this is a, a contrived example really but just to illustrate the point of why getting long reads is important and why it's important is particularly in complex mix as mixes become more complicated and the Tenovo assembly um, challenge becomes more complicated. For, for human stool extractions for doing, um, for doing microbiome st and, uh, studies, we're not able to extract DNA anywhere near to two to 300,000 base pairs. Um, and that has to do with the fact that microbes um, you know, in real clinical samples, have um, are you know, there's a they're complex samples containing a mixture of viruses, bacteria, and fungi. They have very hard uh, cell walls, some of them, um, compared to the human and the E. coli that we that we were demonstrating this method on before. So instead of trying to target reads of two to three hundred thousand base pairs, we're really targeting um, DNA input of one to fifty kb. So. Um, so the, the, so the, other, the other library prep method, which is common for nanopore sequencing ligation libraries, comes back into to play because we don't want to, if we're only able to extract DNA up to 50,000 50, base pairs and we're trying to maximize our read length, we don't want to insert, create an insertion site in the genome and fragment it more using a transposase. So we go back to the um, traditional method of ligation libraries, which originally we avoided because what we found, what we noticed was that during the bead cleanup using Ampure XP beads, there was quite a high degree of fragmentation, and that resulted in even if you had a, a high molecular weight input, that resulted in quite short fragments being um, due to due to shearing basically during the cleanup. But um, if you're starting with a shorter input, and there's also the additional uh, fact that we've now managed to come up with ways to avoid doing bead cleanups at all, which is um, which was pioneered by um, someone called John Tyson in Vancouver, who discovered a way of using peg and salt precipitation to avoid the use of ampere beads. So ampere beads actually work on peg and salt on a peg and salt uh, precipitation principle anyway, but instead of using the solid phase uh, of, 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 of a bead, we, he, he's using precipitation by spinning in a centrifuge. So he was able to produce a ligation library without any beads at all and found that he could really maximize the, um, the read lengths from that method. So our idea was that we could apply um, ligation libraries and try to generate as high molecular weight DNA from stool as possible. Um, we, could, we could achieve high yields on the Prometheus. So that's what we, that's what we set about to do. Now, um, in, it's very important when you're doing any kind of um, microbiome research to have to have uh, standards um, for validation, and, and that's not just 
for validate for pre, you know validation that your that your method has worked, but also for can be important in development of of um, extraction methods, but also downstream analysis methods such as assembly and taxonomic classification. And these are commonly called mock communities. So the the mock community that we uh, you, you chose was a commercially available product called the Zymo um, Microbial Community Standard, and that comes in two uh, types even and log distributed. So the even contains um, contains the, 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 an even number, uh, even representation of uh, eight bacteria and even representation of two fungi. Uh, the log is is more to simulate a real um, a real uh, microbiome sample where there's a, a large uh, there's a large degree of difference between the, the most and the, the least and the most abundant organisms in the mixture. So this this the log distribution contains uh, cells from uh, 10 to 2 to 10 to the 8, so over, over six logs of, dif of, of difference. Um, there's three, there's, is, as I mentioned briefly earlier, there's, it's important to know that your um, one of the big factors success of an extraction procedure is whether it works on gram-negative, gram-positive, and fungi. And uh, in order to prove that, you need you need you need to have mixture in your you need to have a mixture of these different organisms in your in your validation sample. So this one contains uh, appropriately uh, a few gram negatives, some gram positives, and also some fungi. And the actual species are Pseudomonas originosa, E. coli, Salmonella, um, this Lactobacillus fermentum, Enterococcus faecalis, uh, Staph aureus, uh, Listeria monocytogenes, uh, Bacillus subtilis, and then the two yeasts are Saccharomyces cerevisiae and Cryptococcus neoformans. So it's it's a good um, good range of organisms in there. It's actually um, classified as cellular. So um, intact cells, except the fact that in order to be in, in, in order to inactivate it for shipping, it ships in something called DNA and RNA uh, DNA slash RNA shield, which actually does cause some lysis, in the, especially in the gram-negative organisms. Um, so when we do this, we make sure that we retain the um, the, 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 the supernatant, if you like. So if you were to pellet it out, you, you would pellet some cells, but also it's important to retain the supernatant because that, that will contain some DNA from, from, um, from gram-negative organisms that have, have lysed. Um, so, yes, and, the, and there's also Illumina data available for, for, the, for the community. So we've, we've recently published um, our results using, um, using the microbial standard, both the even and the log, and sequencing on the um, Oxford Nanopore Promethean instrument. And this is actually the first peer-reviewed publication which contains uh, data produced by the, by the Promethean instruments, which is, so, so it's, it's very cutting edge. And um, the, these are some, some basic run statistics. So the, uh, the, the plot, of, plot A shows, shows a collective curve of data generated so the, the so the, the 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 log and the even community on the Promethean generated in excess of 160 gigabases in a in a 90 hour run or longer. The two lower down curves show the show the show the min iron or, or the grid it's actually the grid iron um, um, flow cells which we did, and you can see that they they generate about 15 to 20 gigabases per run. The figure on the right shows the even and the log communities for both the gridiron and the Promethean. And you can see the, the in terms of accuracy, the modal accuracy of the of the instruments is in excess of ninety percent and 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 very consistent between both the both the two nanopore platforms and both the two communities of the even and the log. So it's all so so that's so that's something that we that we're able to 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 you know is a validation that we're able to perform. From the log community, we can also we can also produce alignment statistics for each of the organisms against the reference genome for both the for both the Promethean and the gridiron. And you can see that the the diagonal line represents the expected abundance of those organisms. And you can see that the from the from the alignment statistics they fall very nicely um, and tightly uh, along the diagonal line, which means basically that we're sequencing the, the, the expected proportions that we that we that we're hoping to, and that tells you that you're you're that you're not introducing 
um, any biases in either the extraction or the sequencing or the, um, the analysis procedure. And in this particular case, we're doing bead beating, which is on, on, the entire, on the entire sample, so you wouldn't expect there to be very much bias. This is a table showing the, uh, showing the same data and you can, for the log community, and you can see that for the highest, um, uh, for the highest abundant, abundant organism in the log community, the Listeria monocytogenes, we've got 36,800x coverage for the Promethean data. And then for the next um, six organisms, we have, up to, we have uh, 20x coverage, which we would term to be sufficient to assemble the, the genome. And then below that, we have um, 2x coverage for the lactobacillus fermentum, which is enough, in, which is enough data to, 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 just to identify genes, a, a subset of the genes, and some genome scale information, but not enough to assemble. And then below that, for the Focalis and Neoformans and the Aureus, we have detectable quantities, but very, very low, um, not enough to find um, very much information out about the organism, but just enough to detect it. So you can see that even with the vast sequencing power of the, the Prometheon, we're able to, um, we're still able to be, to be stumped by this six logs of abundance. So this really represents the, the sort of state of the art at the moment, um, and it works over a, over, over a fairly wide range. Um, but we're only able to detect the lowest input, um, which was um, the Staph aureus, which represented about 400 cells in the, in, the, in the sequencing library, which was only one picogram. So we are able to detect all the organisms, six out of 10 organisms at high enough coverage to assemble, um, two to, to, to preserve some, some, some genome scale information and one, um, sorry, one to preserve some, to, to provide some genome scale information, and then three to provide, to, just to be detected. So the next section is about using the, um, the community to optimize our extraction methods for, for, improved, for increased read length. And the first section, uh, first, the first slide I'm going to present here is maybe a little bit controversial, but I think it's important to note that what I did in this experiment was I took uh, the microbial community and I used the same, um, the same uh, lysis procedure uh, but then I took the, the lysate and I split it between a spin column and a magnetic bead extraction and then sequenced them both. And what you see here is that the spin column causes so much shearing um, down, down to 10,000 10, base pairs, uh, the sort of maximum that you can get from the, from the spin column extraction. But even though you have this potential, you know, this, these, long, these long fragments in your lysate, the, 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 there's too much shear, there's so much shearing caused by the, um, by the spin column uh, procedure that you're limiting your read length to about 10,000 base pairs. So I make the, the slightly bold statement here that spin columns do not, uh, do not support long reads in this particular application. And I, I would recommend um, the use of magnetic bead um, base cleanup in this case, which will, which will allow you to, to, to recover up to 30,000 base pair uh, DNA fragments. Um, and the, the kit, the kit. This is the, these kit, these. This is a, a, a very able to make a very sort of tightly controlled comparison here, due to the fact that um, Thymo make uh, uh, these two kits, the mag bead kit and the spin column kit, with the the same binding chemistry. So the, these beads are sil these are silica beads, and, and they use the same binding chemistry as the spin column. So you're able to split the lysate, uh, and it's a very tightly controlled experiment. So I, I mentioned, I've already briefly talked about the differences in the cell wall compositions of different organisms, but this really is the crux of the problem, which is that you get a very wide diversity of bacterial, of that bacterial species in your, in, your, in your real clinical samples, and they have very different compositions. So uh, bacteria, uh, gram-positive bacteria, um, have, a, have a tough cell wall. Um, but in both gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria can also have an additional capsule layer. Then if you're, if you're looking at a microbial community, you're also going to have yeasts, which can have um, very tough um, beta-glucan or chitinous layers protecting them. Um, and you can also have spore-forming bacteria. 
which can have um, a spore cortex um, of, of peptidoglycan, and also they can have a, a keratin coat. So these are very, very uh, stable, difficult molecules to disrupt. Um, in addition, and, and, and in, as well as that, they also have a very wide range of chemical compositions, which make which make um, digestion quite quite a challenging procedure. So to tackle this, um, there's Got Thai, uh, who should take most of the credit for this work, uh, has developed something called Metapolyzyme for the um, ABRF Metagenomics Research Group, which is a cocktail of six enzymes. Um, you might have heard of of, of, D, of, of DNA extraction enzymes in terms of the sort of common ones such as uh, lysozyme, but what he did was cocktail together six enzymes, metanolysin, chromopeptidase, lytocase, chitinase, lysostatin, and lysozyme, together in, in a single buffer um, where they all have activity. Um, and, and what that will do is sort of attack the broadest possible spectrum of, of chemical compositions of cell walls in bacteria and yeast. And uh, what, what that will do is digest away the cell wall, uh, leaving, only the, uh, leaving only the cell or the plasma membrane uh, bound cell, which is either a seroplast or a protoplast in gram-negative or gram-positive organisms. And then that leaves it to be very susceptible to a, to a, a chemical lysis by detergent. So um, we can use the we can use uh, avoid sort of dam or sort of shearing physical dis disruptions such as bead beating uh, in favour of, of, of gentle uh, enzymatic digestion in order to recover um, re in order to recover longer fragments of DNA. And that's really the basis behind our method, which we call the three peaks method. So when we take a real sample, or, or I mean. Or the or the mock community uh, or the or or a, or a real sample, uh, we 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 expose it to three sequential methods of chemical, enzymatic, and physical lysis of increasing um, of, of increasing harshness effectively. Um, and what we do is we remove the DNA that's uh, that's be able to recover at each individual step, so it doesn't get damaged by the subsequent step. So, for example, um, after chemical lysis. We spin down the, uh, the remaining cells, take off the supernatant, put it to one side. Then we take all the remaining cells. We, um, we expose them to an enzymatic digestion with metapolyzyme. Um, then we spin that down. And anything that's still, uh, anything, any cells that are still remaining at the end, we expose to, uh, to physical disruption of bee beating, which is going to cause quite severe um, DNA fragmentation it will maintain the representation. That's the crucial thing. You can't uh, trade off your fragment length for your, for your representation because you have to know uh, what's in your sample, even if you can't recover long frag uh, high molecular weight DNA from it. So this is a, an experiment here where we show the abundances of, um, of the, the organisms in the mock community uh, with different treatments. So the red is the, uh, just the, is the supernatant and the uh, bee beating. The green is the supernatant and the metapolyzyme treatment, and then the blue is the supernatant, the metapolyzyme, and the bead beating, the full three peaks method. And what you can see notably is that the without the bead beating, we lose the representation of the cryptococcus. So that uh, so the cryptococcus neoformans um, is very underrepresented, 25x under 25x uh, times uh, underrepresented when we don't do bead beating. And in this particular case. This is an excellent example of the validation data showing you that in this case, the strain of cryptococcus neoformans in the mix was not susceptible to the digestion by the metapolyzyme. And this here shows the optimized um, extraction method um, that we developed using the magnetic beads, but also the three peaks together, showing that we were able to, we were able to sequence um, the mic to produce DNA from the microbial community with an M50 of nearly 26,000 base pairs. So that's, that's the combination of using the, um, of the splitting out the extraction to, to preserve the fragment length from, with the three peaks and then doing the cleanup um, isolation using the magnetic, bead which we, the magnetic beads which we found to be able to, pre, pre, to, to preserve DNA. So we call that the optimized uh, method. And, um, and we also assembled these these uh, these data sets. And this is 
done using a program called FLY, which is a, uh, a sort of most recent generation um, single molecule assembler um, using a repeat graph um, using a repeat graph algorithm. And to be honest, the the the, the assembler is so good that we that this is the this is the non-optimized data. So this is the, showing the comparison between the original GigaScience data set, which was just all bead beaten, and then the optimized method, which was the three peaks and the, bead, and the magnetic bead extraction. And really, the assembler is doing such a good job, even on the bead beating, that you, that you don't see uh, so much difference here with these bacterial species. But if we look at the yeast, um, obviously it's a larger genome containing you know, considerable numbers of repeats. You start to see here that the optimized method with the long fragments is generating larger configs for the, for, 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 the, for, for, the, for the yeast species, particularly the Saccharomyces cerevisiae here. So these dot, we don't have the data for, the, for, the, for, for all of the 10 species because we didn't have a reference genome for all of these. In order to produce this dot plot, we needed to be able to have a reference genome. So we have the Saccharomyces there. Um, I'd also like to draw your attention to um, a video if you're interested in, in learning more about fly. Um, and how the algorithm works. There's a video on the Long Read um, Club YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash Long Read Club. Um, um, and that, that is, that's, that's, a good, that's a good resource for, for, for that we're starting to compile um, information on Long Read sequencing. And now I'm going to show here a slide which contains our, uh, all of our uh, fecal, fecal, uh, fecal extraction Promethean and, and minion data that we have so far. And these are the real chemical samples. So there are the, the N50s here, they're a lot shorter than the 26,000 base pairs which we're able to, to achieve with the optimized method on the mock community. But still, very, since we were still able to generate um, N50s up to, seven, up to nearly 17,000 base pairs. Um, for some of these real clinical samples, which is, which you know, we're very happy with because. So, you know, this is a this is a real a real um, a real clinical sample contain you know a complex clinical sample difficult to work with um, real feces rather than just the cellular mock community and we're still able to generate um, some really nice long uh, um, some really nice long reads with with this method up to seventeen thousand base pairs and you can see that the yields are also um, very high. Um, some of these Promethean runs, we have two in excess of 100, 110 gigabases. So this is giving you the length and the yield required to do to assemble these and do some really fine detailed analysis of these communities. And to illustrate the um, the three peaks method again, this is a histogram of the read lengths showing what the actual um, read lengths look like if you do this. So we do the the, the you can see from the histogram there is only really two peaks, and that's because um, that's because the chemical lysis uh, from the from the first step and the metapolyzyme they both produce quite long DNA of twenty sort of twenty to fifty k, uh, kilobases, and those those distributions overlap, so they appear to be one on the on this plot. And then you see the bead beating, which is where you put the 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 the, the, the cells inside a, a tube containing a matrix of Particles, which can be um, some, you know, gar mineral like garnet and things like that, and then you expose it to a very high energy um, using a using a bead beating instrument, which is sort of reciprocates or figure of eight the, the you know the, the 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 beads around the tube, causes that sort of physical disruption, that smashing open of the cells. And um, some of these instruments are extremely powerful. They the, um, this is proper bead beating, you know, using a fast prep or something like that. Moves the moves the sample at sort of six meters a second or something. It's very, sort of a, a very it's a very large amount of energy that you're putting into that sample. In fact, if you bead beat a sample for about uh, one minute, take the tube out, it's, it's hot to the touch. That's how much friction these beads cause. Uh, so that's that's why you're able to preserve that representation because you're you're really using in, using a very large amount of energy to disrupt those cells. I just would like to say that the, for the for the U.S. audience, the Three Peaks Challenge, which this is named after, is actually a, um, a sort of United Kingdom cent, uh, cent, centric outdoors challenge, which is actually to visit the largest, uh, the, the tallest, the tallest mountains in um, 
in England, Wales and Scotland in the 24 hour period. So the, the, uh, the future perspectives uh, and sort of as a summary for this talk, um, read lengths are relatively short when using the conventional bead beating or column based extraction methods. We've, we've developed ways to avoid the pitfalls of, of bead beating and both column by changing to the three peaks um, which has the chemical and the enzymatic lysis beforehand, and also moving to the magbead based extraction methods. And, that, and that's shown nice improvements in, in, in fragment lengths, which are you know, going to produce better results when you do long read sequencing with them. We found that metapolyzyme was an important component in this, um, being able to, to, to produce long DNA from, from, you know, from all of the uh, gram positive organisms in the mock community, but also one of the yeast in the mock community. And we think that that's an important, um, an important method going forward. Um, we're actually, there's actually been, uh, going to be a metapolyzyme 2.0 in the pipeline, which we're going to be involved in the, in, in the specking out and the, and the production of. So optimized extraction can give very long reads on nanopore sequencing and, can, and, can, and, and that converts into highly contiguous assemblies. And when the yields on Promethean are now sufficient, over 100 gigabases, for, for, ta for tackling complex communities such as such as the um, such as the, the human gut microbiome project, the yields, however, uh, sorry, the inputs required uh, for, for for Promethean flow are on the order of 500 to 1,000 nanograms. Um, but you can produce that with sort of 100 milligrams uh, of stool, if you, uh, and that's what that's what we do. It's not a large amount. Um, and that we're able to recover genome scale information over a range of four logs using with, with yields like this and detection of organisms over six logs. And uh, all of the data that I've produced that I've talked about today is all available on the um, on, online. This is all open data, open analysis. Um, I work as a postdoc in Nick Lohman's lab. This is the GitHub for the Lohman lab. Um, and all of the work here is, is under a page called the, called the Mock Community. And then finally, I'd like to acknowledge um, uh, my colleagues at the University of Birmingham and Sam Nichols, who did a lot of this work uh, in terms of the analysis. Um, Scott Ty, who's, who's developed and, 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 and helped us out a lot with the metapolyzyme work. John Tyson, who developed the the bead-free method. Our contacts at Oxford Nanopore uh, and Zymo Research, whose technologies I've mainly talked about today, um, and Hannah McDonald for providing me the, 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 uh, the, the mock community, that's the Zymo distributor in the UK. And that's the uh, end of my talk. Thank you for listening. Well, hello and thank you for joining us today for the Zymo Research Webinar. My name is Dr. Janina Grumbeck and I'm the Director of Microbiome Applications at Zymo Research. Today's topic is how we can explore the microbiome with confidence using microbiomics-grade tools and standards. Those tools can help improve the accuracy and reproducibility of microbiome measurements. You probably already know what the microbiome is. It's the study of microbial communities, the study of microbial ecosystems that live everywhere around us. And from the first idea of a living cell that was described by Robert Hooke in 1665, microbiologists have been discovering this whole world of microbes that surround us in an ever fast, faster growing space, pace. <laughs> Um, from the first notion that microbes can ferment food and produce beer and cheese to the understanding that bacteria cause diseases. Many of the techniques that were developed in the golden age of microbiology in the late 1800s are still being used today for medical diagnostics, such as gram standing or the petri dish. But the biggest push for the field really came with the discovery of the DNA helix and the discovery of the 16S RNA marker. Suddenly, we found out there's this whole kingdom of life that we didn't know about before. Because microbes cannot be, because most of the microbes cannot be grown in the lab, 
The sequencing technologies developed faster and faster from the first bacterial genome being sequenced in 1995 to the Human Microbiome Project and Ocean Sampling Day. Now we know that there are about 10 to the 20 microbes on Earth and about 100 trillion microbes on each of us. However, 99% of those microbes are not culturable in the lab, yet they have a huge impact on our lives. The tools to study which microbes are present and what they are doing on a large, high-throughput scale are referred to as metagenomics and next-generation sequencing. This, this term, next-generation sequencing, or short NGS, can be a bit misleading as NGS was actually developed about 15 years ago and we are now in the era of third generation sequencing. And with the development of NGS and decrease in sequencing cost and sequencing time, researchers started studying everything from the oceans to our pets, to ourselves, to agriculture, and even the highest points on Earth. Researchers have been so excited about the possibilities that NGS has offered them that the microbiomics field has grown nearly threefold by the numbers of citations since 2005, with more than 7,000 new publications per year. One of the leading scientists in the field is Dr. Chris Mason from Well Cornell Medicine. He's one of Zymo's closest collaborators, and he's really doing amazing work analyzing the microbiome of cities that we live in in tracing microbes as well as antibiotic resistances. And he says that it's indeed an, ex an exciting time for the field of metagenomics and the microbiome, but there's also limited ability to compare between different research studies, which has greatly hindered the progress of research. And what he means by that, I would like to illustrate in two examples. You might have heard about this story before as it came out in 2012. A researcher collected her own fecal sample and split it into two, and then she sent the two samples to two major U.S. companies that offered fecal microbiome analysis and compared the results, which are shown here on this slide. And the results were drastically different. Both profiles agree that the bacteroidetes and firmicutes are the dominant phyla in her sample, but American gut showed that the abundance of bacteroidetes is much higher than that of the firmicutes. But the ubiome profile shows the complete opposite. The abundance of the firmicutes is much higher. So just one, simple, just one single sample, two dramatically different microbiome profiles by two big players in the field. And what you need to know is that these both companies use very different protocols to process and analyze the sample but still we don't know which one is correct. And while that was just a single sample, this example highlights the drastic impact that different protocols have on the microbiome profile. These are some of the largest microbiome studies yet conducted looking at the human fecal microbiome, the Human Microbiome Project on the left and MetaHead on the right. The Human Microbiome Project alone had funding of 200 million US dollars but just like before, the results are drastically different, even if we're looking at just high taxonomic levels like the phylum. And they, again, are reporting the opposite results regarding the ratio of the bacteroidetes and firmicutes. Again, both projects use different protocols, and we don't know which results are true. And when we take a more detailed look at the microbiomics workflow, it's not surprising that the results can be so drastically different when using different protocols, as each step of the workflow can have a huge impact on the final result. I will go over the major causes that introduce this bias to the microbiome measurements. The first major driver of bias is the sample collection and storage. Keep in mind that you are collecting living organisms that are highly diverse. Some organisms may decay or keep growing in your sample. And that's what I'm illustrating here. They are so diverse, it's like trying to store and ship dry ice cubes versus rocks versus bread. One may disappear really fast, others are quite stable, and others may start molding and decaying. And to illustrate what this means, um, even major publications like the American Gut Project 
struggle with things like this. Here's an example of a fecal sample, and it's not protected, and we're just looking at a higher phylum level, and you already see a big difference from day one, day zero to day one, where there is this pink growth on top, and these are E. coli. And E. coli can drastically grow very fast in your sample. And like I said, even major publications face the challenge of sample collection and that bacterial growth and decay of nucleotide acid degradation compromise microbiome measurements. In this case of the American gut, uh, there, was a, there was an increase of E. coli introduced by the sample collection and it required editing of the data to retry and remove bacterial brooms of E. coli artificially from the data after the samples were already collected and processed. Those issues can be avoided though. Zymo Research has developed DNA RNA preservative called DNA RNA Shield that prevents this from happening and can preserve the DNA for up to one year at room temperature. So now that we know that we can store our samples without worrying that any changes to the microbiome occur, the next step is the DNA and RNA extraction. Again, we are dealing with microbes that are highly diverse with many diverse characteristics. Some are easy to lyse like E. coli, others are difficult to lyse like Listeria with different cell sizes. Just like this example, you might need different tools to break open an egg versus a marble. If you don't lyse the cells, the DNA of those organisms won't get sequenced and the organisms are underrepresented in your samples. So depending on which lysis method you use, like bead beading or chemical lysis, the results are very different. This is one of the major reasons why the results from the Human Microbiome Project and MetaHit are so different the overrepresentation of easy to lyse organisms. This is something you should particularly pay attention to when choosing your protocol. I don't have time to go into details today, but Zymo Research has also developed DNA and RNA extraction kits that can avoid this type of bias. Bias in the library prep can be introduced based on varying GC content, PCR inhibitors, the formation, the, form, the formation of chimera, or the primer design itself, which may not cover all organisms in your sample. The sequencing platforms themselves also have some sequencing errors associated with them. And finally, the bioinformatic pipelines that are using can have a huge impact as well, depending on how the alignments, the chimera removal, the clustering are handled to name just a few of them. And of course, which reference database you're using. As Dr. Cano put it, relatively minor alterations in the DNA extraction procedure or in the bioinformatics analysis can give a distorted view. And none of these steps in the workflow are trivial, but the workflow is complex and prone to error. Many products and methods have not been validated for microbiome work simply because those tools were never designed for microbiome or NGS work. Many buffers for the extraction never needed to be as clean as we need them to be now because sequences can start picking up bacteria that were added to your samples simply because they were already present in the buffers. So this is very particular to ensure that your buffers are clean. With the rapid growth of the microbiome field, there has been consequences. The accuracy and reproducibility of issues are rampant, and we know about those issues. And this paper was published in 2015, but four years later, the results are still the same and the requirements are still the same. For every PCR that you run, you need a positive and a negative control, but for microbiomics measurements, there's currently no such requirement by any um, journals. And Costea et al. did an extensive comparison between different studies, comparing 21 of the most cited D different DNA extraction protocols. And here I'm listing some of their highlighted findings. They found that the protocol used dramatically, dramatically influenced the conclusions taken from comparative studies. Every step from simple, 
sample collection and storage to the extraction methods used had a huge impact on the outcome. So the variation between protocols was larger than the variation between subjects. And they are not the only ones that have been looking into this, and there are now several more studies that have been published and look spe specifically at this problem of bias between different studies and extraction protocols. But we as researchers rely on other publications to conduct and do our own research for every grant proposal, every paper we write. We put our own research into reference what other people have been publishing. And this has great consequences on our own work. So let's just look at a very simplified example. Let's say study A claims we found a large gem, which is pretty amazing and everyone is excited. But then study B says, hey, we found a small gem. And when you start comparing those two studies, those two gems look pretty much alike. But is it now a large one? or a small one, and how can we compare those results? Especially now that we know that every single step of the protocol can have a huge impact on the results. But how can we draw any conclusions without using a reference? Because measurements are always relative, but once we add a scale to the findings, we can actually start comparing the results. Of course, there are different kinds of scales that we could use, and some may be more appropriate than others. And even in the history of our world, we haven't quite been able to just agree on a single scale to measure something like distance. But ideally, we can agree on just one or two scales for microbiome measurements so we can translate the findings and communicate our results clearly with one another. Because keep in mind, every single step of the workflow influences the outcome and even change the perspective of the microbiome that we, and the results we find. And I hope that I have convinced you that using a standard for microbiome studies is needed. SAMO Research has now developed multiple standards that can help you identify if there is any bias in your workflow all the way from sample collection and preservation to the bioinformatic analysis. This is what Zymo's microbial community standard number one looks like. It's the mock community of 10 different organisms, eight bacteria and two yeast in an even abundance. These organisms were specifically selected to represent a wide variety of different cell sizes toughness of the cell wall and GC content like you would find in a wide variety of different samples. This standard can be used for general benchmarking and microbiome profiling. The whole cell is the mock community for the complete workflow, so everything from sample collection, DNA extraction, and so on. And the DNA mock community is for the library prep and bioinformatics part of the pipeline. Of course, accuracy matters here. If you want to benchmark your work to a standard, that standard has to be as accurate as possible. Zymo Research guarantees that there is less than 15% deviation from the defined composition and less than 0.01 foreign microbial DNA contamination. The same standard is also available on a log scale to to assess the detection limit and sensitivity of the workflow. Again, it's provided as a whole cell a mix or as the DNA mix. Zymo has also developed spike in controls. This standard can be used as an internal process control and enables absolute quantifications of microbes in a sample. So there is no need to run additional qPCRs, for example. The standard is available in high and low bacterial load depending on the bio burden of the sample you're using. So you know exactly how many cells of these two organisms that we provide you're using, and you can see at the last step of your workflow how much percent of those two organisms do you find, and you can calculate back the absolute abundances of your cells. So this is a really great tool that saves you a lot of time running without the need to run additional qPCRs. The new standard that Zymo has developed is the Zyman, the Zymo Biomics High Molecular Weight DNA Standard that was created to help validate long-read metagenomic tools and pipelines. 
It's composed of purified high molecular weight DNA, larger than 50 kb, from seven bacteria and one yeast, as listed here. The taxonomic diversity can help with the development and validation of long-read metagenomic bioinformatic tools, just like we heard Dr. Quick talk about earlier. As shown in this graph on the left, high-quality read DNA uh, data is generated from the Zymobiomics High Molecular Weight DNA Standard. In the Oxford Nanopore Min-Ion Sequencing run shown here, the histogram shows an average read length of 24 kb and more than 125 kb recorded. So Zymo Research is offering a control for the entire microbiomics workflow to address every single step that could you introduce bias into your data, from sample collection and preservation using DNA-RNA shield to using specific DNA and RNA extraction methods based on your sample type and needs to library preparation kits, and we also offer next-generation data sequencing analysis. So for the past 10 minutes, I've described the immense challenges faced by the field, but also showed you that they can be resolved. Simon Research has built a complete pipeline for microbiome studies and has resolved major workflow challenges faced by customers. I didn't have time today to go into specific details, but Zymo is offering a solution for every step of the way, providing standard solutions for unbiased sample collection, unbiased DNA extraction, library preparation, and data analysis. We are currently offering the Microbiomics Standards and Controls Initiative, the MySci Initiative. You can simply tell us about your project and we will provide you with free standards that you can incorporate into your workflow to see if there is any bias in your workflow. You simply sign up on our website and we will send you the mock community standards just as you need it. And with that, I'm at the end of my presentation and I would be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Quick and Dr. Crumbeck for your informative presentations. We will now start the Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. All right, let's get started. Our first question is, how can the read lengths be improved further? Um, <clears throat> I think that's a, it's a good question. Really, uh, what we're what we're talking about is how do you improve from from read lengths of sort of ten tens of kb to to bridge the gap to what we what we're able to to the ultra long reads which we're able to achieve um, which we're able to achieve on on the on certain gram negatives and um, and uh, human cells. And that is definitely not an easy task for for many gram positive um, spore and fungi. I think that really, if you so the, the options we have really are are further development of enzymatic approaches to broaden the the, the substrate specificity of those, um, to move to um, some to move to uh, some sort of, some entirely novel form or some entirely not explore other sort of non-standard forms of cell lysis. There are some examples already of of using um, free, you know heat cycling or freeze thaw um, for cracking cells open. There's uh, examples of ultrasonication being used to disrupt cell membranes. So really, I think that unless there's unless there's a, unless there's uh, some sort of com some completely non-standard uh, method of cell sort of cell disruption, then really we're talking about further development or optimization of of chemical and enzymatic methods. Thank you. All right. The next question is: How will this help further understanding of human disease? 
just goes back to this question goes back to my introductory slide really and in I gave a couple of examples of projects which we're involved in here at Birmingham um, the first being um, the 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 fecal transplantation clinical trial um, and in that in the clinical trial we're, we're collecting um, uh, fecal samples from day one of the day of, of the recipient the, re the receipt of the donation of the, of the transplantation and then um, at day 56 of the transplantation and what we're interested in is how many um, species uh, persist uh, to 56 days and the way that we're doing that is by taking, uh, doing shotgun metagenomics, so extracting all the DNA from the um, from those samples, assembling them, and then then trying to um, identify um, persistence of individual strains. And it's quite a sort of simple, basic analysis, or that you might have done in the past. Um, might have been to do some sort of 16S, which will give you a genus or, or you know potentially species level assignments. Um, or Illumina short short read metagenomics, which would potentially give you species level assignments. Um, but but really, what we're talking about now, the cutting edge, is whole genomes and strains. And can we identify um, you know strain level diversity within a species um, within a microbial community? And that's really that's really where where the hot ticket is these days. Um, in order to further our understanding of of, 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 of microbial communities, the, the dynamics at play and the interactions with human disease. Thank you. It looks like we have time for one more question. Are there any other method, methods for cell life in development? Um, so I, I I briefly I briefly mentioned a couple of other methods that I knew about in the, you know in, in my answer to the previous question. So um, in addition to to um, to chemical, which are usually detergent-based lysis uh, detergent-based methods for solubilizing membranes, um, I also talked about um, enzymatic methods and the development of of uh, broader broader spectrum enzyme cocktails. Such as metapolyzyme 2.0, um, and then I, I talked about uh, physical disruption methods, which normally which normally involve uh, very you know, very very harsh physical physical uh, treatment, such as a bead beating. Um, the, then I mentioned uh, freeze thaw processes, where you try to uh, basically freeze the sample in order to to, to to crack the cell open via the action of the expansion of water, um, which 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 obviously expands when it freezes, um, and also um, ultrasonication um, methods as a sort of non-standard um, uh, approach towards towards cell wall, towards uh, disruption of microbial cells. Uh, I can think of a couple of other non-standard methods, such as um, cytotoxins, so pore-forming pore proteins. Um, Similar to nanopores themselves, actually, but uh, but in a, in, a, in a completely different context. Uh, any proteins which can puncture their way through uh, cell membranes um, could be a, one possible way of causing cell lysis. Antimicrobial peptides, another class of molecules which could potentially be used um, uh, for the, in the same way. Um, and that's all I can think of at the moment. <laughs> thank you for and your important research. We would also like to thank Lab Roots and our sponsor, Simo Research, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and for their interesting questions. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speakers via the contact information you provided at the time of registration. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's event. Until next time, goodbye.